Genesis 22. It's a special chapter, I think, in the book of Genesis. There's many of them, but that this one is really very special. While you're turning to Genesis 22, I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis. Uh, you may know who he was. He became a Christian later on in life. And also, he married late in life. And in fact, he was only married a few years, and his wife contracted cancer. She went into remission, and then it came back in full force, and he lost his wife very soon, just a few years after they were married. He wrote many books. He was a professor at uh, Oxford in, in England, but he also, um, he was a, a Christian author and a philosopher. One of the books that he wrote is called The Four Loves. And in The Four Loves, he explains to his readers what will happen when they reach heaven. And he said, uh, you'll meet the Lord, the one for whom we were made, and the true author, he says, of all innocent love. Lewis says that in heaven, we really won't have a problem leaving our loved ones behind for a couple of reasons. And one reason he gives is this, and I love this. He says, because we shall find them all in him. By loving him more than them, we shall love them more than we do now. I want to repeat that, and I want it to sink in. Think about it. He says, by loving him, God, more than them, our loved ones, we shall love them, our loved ones, more than we do now. You can't love God enough. And when you love God more, he's saying you'll love others more than you do now. Because a genuine love for God is a purifying of human love. It really is. And with that thought, I want us to open here to Genesis 22 tonight. Because what we read about in this chapter is just amazing when you stop to just think about, whoa, what's going on here? This is, this is a monumental test in the life of a man. A man that loved his son, waited a long time for it. And so I want to share with you tonight what I'm calling loving him more by looking at it three angles. I want to see in this passage, supreme love tested, supreme love proved, and then thirdly, supreme love rewarded. All right, let's pause a moment and pray. Lord, as we consider the way in which you work with your servant Abraham, Lord, I pray that we would understand more your ways with us and what you're seeking to accomplish in us. So, Lord, make this, make this uh, very applicable and practical in our own lives. And may we leave here, as I've titled this message, Loving You More. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's begin by seeing supreme love tested in the first few verses of this chapter it says in verse 1, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt, and you should understand the word tempt to mean test. God put Abraham to the test. God did tempt or test Abraham. How? He said to him, Abraham, and he said, like a willing servant of the Lord, here I am. He said, verse 2, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, 
and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell thee of. Supreme love tested. That is for its genuineness, for the genuineness of this love. Now, just think about it. How is this love tested? It's tested, first of all, on the basis that this son was cherished by Abraham, his father. Isaac was the very son that Abraham and Sarah wanted so desperately, and they waited so long for him. He was the son that was given them in a miraculous way, and as a result, fulfilled the promise of God to them. Isaac was the one and only. Take thine son, thine only son. He was the apple of their eye. In fact, in the previous chapter, 21, we have a record there of his birth, as well as the feast that Abraham and Sarah threw when he was weaned as a child. And now, chapter later, this doting father who idolized his son is called upon to kill him. Supreme love is tested at the very place of a love that's cherished. And of course, it brings him to a place where he had to decide. And look at how he decided here. Says that, verse 3, he rose up early in the morning. He saddled his ass, his donkey. He took two of his young servant men with him. He took his son Isaac. He took the wood that he had chopped for the burnt offering rose up, went to the place that God told him to, to go. Verse 4, the third day, he lifted up his eyes. He saw the place afar off. Boy, the, how that must have really hit him when he actually saw the place that he was going to offer up his son. And Abram said, verse 5, to his young man, abide here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. <laughs> I'm going to kill my son, but he calls it worship. And But look at his faith, verse 5, and we'll come again to you. I and my son are going to come back to you. I'm, I know I'm going to kill him, but we're going to come back to you. And Abram took the wood, verse 6. He laid it on his son's Isaac. He took the fire in his hand, a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto his father, Abraham, and said, My father, here am I, my son. Behold, the fire and the wood, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and he laid the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and he laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Abraham, take the boy that you have cherished, and you have to make a decision. And Abraham did. Abraham decided God made you and I to be the object of his love. And that the thing that really identifies us as the people of God is that you and I love God above everything else and above everyone else. He is our first love. Remember the Shema that the Jewish people say every day. And it includes that very thought that they are to love the Lord their God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their might, all of their strength. Remember when I, one of the, um, one of the Pharisees, I guess it was, or 
scribes asked Jesus, what is the great, the first and great commandment? And Jesus said, love God with all of your heart, your soul. And he didn't say might, he said mind. Set your mind, your thinking on loving God. And this is what this man did. He set his mind. He loved God with all of his mind. He decided that he was going to obey God, whatever the cost. That's the command. Love God with your whole being, if I can say it that way. But you know, love can't be commanded. Love has to be freely given. To love is a choice. It cannot be demanded and be genuine. And so if anyone is going to obey that first and great commandment, it's a choice on their part. They have decided of their own free will to love God. Well, this is the, the supreme love tested. Let's look at the supreme love proved. We've already read down uh, to verse 10. Let's go down to verse 12. He took the knife. He grabbed that knife. He was going to go through with it. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here he is again. Here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Now, do you think that God didn't know that already? What God was uh, saying in that is that you've passed the test. The supreme love that has been tested has now been proved. Your love is the real thing because you have obeyed. This is what proves our love for God. This kind of obedience. This is obedience beyond human imagination. Abraham was determined to hurt his son Isaac. If it was necessary for him to love God supremely, then he would do what God was calling him to do. And he came so close to doing it. He picked up the knife to kill Isaac. There is just unquestioning obedience that could only be explained by the fact that this man, Abraham, absolutely without any doubt whatsoever, trusted fully in his father, God, in his Lord. In fact, that's how the writer of Hebrews says it. In Hebrews chapter 11, listen to this. By faith, that is by God dependence, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises prior to that, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called, and you're going to put an end to that seed. And then here's how he did it. By faith, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. In in this man's mind, his son was sacrificed already. He had decided, and he obeyed. And this, to me, this account is the epitome of a human being trusting in God. I don't see any greater story or account in, in human life than this one. Here is a human being that utterly trusted in God by faith. And it just tells us that supreme love is proved when whatever God puts into our hands, we hold it before him with an open hand and not tight-fisted. Whether it be a dear loved one, whether it be some... Uh, uh, material possession, whatever, 
This is the proof of supreme love. He obeyed. And uh, it's confirmed by this incredible act of faith. Abraham confirms the truth that his love for God was number one. And you know God asks nothing less of us. In fact, he says, if any man come uh, to me in Matthew 10 and verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is what God says. It's not only the supreme love that Abraham had to prove. It's the pr supreme love that we must prove for God as well. In another uh, example, in the book of Luke, Jesus has a massive following. And all in the midst of this, he, he, he whirls around and he stops dead in his tracks and he looks at, at this crowd that's following him. And he, he, he says these withering words to them. He says, if you don't hate father and mother, son and daughter, you can't be my disciple. In other words, if your love for me is not supreme, forget about discipleship. Forget about being my true follower. So Abraham proved his supreme love. He obeyed and then he confirmed it. But here's the point that I really want you to think about tonight. He died. Not Isaac. Abraham died. Really, this scripture is a tremendous illustration and example of what it means to die to self. As Abraham obeyed, in his mind he had already killed Isaac. His human love for his cherished son was so great. You know, a father would rather die than have anything hurt his child. If it would in any way prevent his son's death, he would have died in his place. I guarantee that. But Abraham loved God not only more than he loved Isaac. Listen to me. He loved God more than he loved himself. And when you think about it, Abraham's entire future, as far as the promise of God was concerned, was tied up in that son. And so when Abraham decided that he was going to love God supremely, he died to himself. Before Isaac died in Abraham's heart, Abraham himself died. He died to his self-life. And in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38, it says, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In chapter 16 and uh, verse 24, after Peter tries to stop Jesus from going to the cross, Jesus said, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, that means die to self, and follow me. He died in this incident. And that is supreme love proved. And then let's look at the last point. I call it supreme love rewarded. And if you go back to the 22nd chapter of Genesis <clears throat> in verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, a ram behind him caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and he offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son as a substitute. And Abraham called the name of the place Yahweh Yireh. As it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Yahweh Yireh. It means the Lord will see to it or the Lord will provide. Supreme love is rewarded by the source himself. How is it rewarded? 
this ram in what is provided here in the midst of death to self and uh, this personal loving sacrifice to God, Abraham experiences God as Yahweh Yare. God blessed his sacrifice with this wonderful provision, this substitute, this, this ram caught the thicket. And it's in our loving willingness to lose our lives that we discover God's provision and God's reward because he says again in that same uh, passage in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And what he means by losing his life for my sake is dying to self in order to prove your supreme love for me. And so... Supreme love is rewarded because God is the one he provided, but also he blessed. Look at what he goes on to say. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord, verse 15, called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself, I have sworn, saith the Lord. And by the way, <laughs> the angel of the Lord is the Lord <laughs> because the angel of the Lord says, by myself, you know, I, the Lord, uh, said this. For because thou hast done this thing, and thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, in blessing I will bless. Here's the covenant blessing. In blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. Thy seed shall possess the gate of thy enemies. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice, because you have loved me supremely, you're blessed. Covenant blessing, personal blessing, but blessing then that is transferred to the nation of Israel, but it doesn't end there. It becomes not only personal blessing, it becomes global blessing. All the nations of the earth are blessed. In the nation of Israel, he promises it lasts forever because, of course, its fulfillment of this covenant is in the capital S E E D, the seed that Paul tells us in Galatians 3:16 is Messiah. And so it's a eternal blessing because here's the picture that Paul paints for us in Romans 8, 32. He, I think, is alluding to Abraham offering up his son Isaac. And you know what he says? God, who spared not his own son, his only begotten son, but delivered him up for us all. Or as the prophet Isaiah says in the 53rd chapter, it pleased the father to bruise him when he made his soul an offering for sin. Look, no so-called God ever did that for any human being. There's no greater love than that. That Christ died for not just sinners, that's bad enough, but he died for his enemies that he might reconcile us to the Father. You know what's interesting? I didn't mention this, but as you read Genesis 22, Isaac knew what was happening. He had to know. That's why he questioned like he did. But there's no struggle. He's tied up without a word spoken by him. Because he is a picture of another son who would willingly lay down his life and with perfect peace, he would pour out his life as an offering for sin. And in doing so, he would condemn sin in his body on that tree. It reminds me of that song in our hymnal. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this?